Now in the Gospel of John, there are several passages where Jesus says, I am these things. Like, for example, we'll talk about the Good Shepherd. Jesus says, I'm the Good Shepherd. So what's that mean, and how does it work? And uh, so we're going to have a series in which we uh, talk about those. Next week, we'll be talking about Jesus, I am the Bread of Life. And next week's Communion. So get it? Bread of Life, Communion. Kind of brilliant. Okay, yeah. So uh, we talk about how that works next week. And so we're going to have all these different sayings, but I'm concerned about how we view Jesus and who Jesus is, how Jesus moves, and sometimes we can have a wrong perspective of Jesus. In fact, the reason Jesus did these sayings was because the people who came and uh, he went to and cared for and shared himself to, they had a wrong image of what the Messiah was. And so he was using these images to say, you might be kind of confused who I am and what I'm about, but here's some images that help you to understand what that is. They would have understood what a shepherd was. They would have understood the bread of life. They would have understood these images. And so Jesus was saying, here's who I am and what I'm about. And I believe not only did that apply to the people at the time of Jesus and how they could have understood it, but it applies to us today as well. And so we're in a place where we want to begin to see this perspective. And I think it's important to understand this in the context of two questions. Not only do we ask the question of who does Jesus say that I am, but in light of who Jesus says he is, who are we? So who are we in the context of what Jesus has said? And also, too, where do we have our image of Jesus messed up? Where do we have our image of Jesus framed by our culture, framed by maybe what we think we want or our ideas in our minds as opposed to what's a biblical concept of Jesus? Because the Bible is a place of truth, and truth has to speak into our lives. And sometimes truth is challenging. Oftentimes truth is challenging. In fact, almost always truth is challenging. And interestingly enough, Jesus oftentimes divides. Because the reality is he is the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. And so Jesus is one that we have to look at. He paints this portrait about who he is so people can understand it. And so that we need to do that as well. So that's what we'll be stepping through in these next few weeks. Who Jesus is. And then how we as a community who are around this image come together and support one another. And we need that in our lives. So if you would, join with a prayer, and then we'll, we'll step into this, uh, this teaching time. Holy God, take this sermon and make it yours and not mine. Help us to see the Good Shepherd for who the Good Shepherd is. And help us to see who we are in the context of the Good Shepherd and what we need in our lives. Lord, help us to look at this uh, and to understand that this image of Jesus is one that is God's, ultimately. And the image that Jesus paints of himself are ones that we want to be able to understand from God's perspective. Not just our image of who we've painted Jesus to be, which is oftentimes in our own image, but instead, let us let your word be our guide and be our truth. In your name we pray and believe. Amen. So, we live in a world of risk. We live in a world that has danger, that lurks around us, that is difficult and hard. And in fact, it's fascinating. We like to try to avoid risk and avoid danger in every single way possible. And a lot of those things we do are very just smart to do. They're things that we should do. We should wear our seatbelt, shouldn't we? It helps us out. If we have an accident, it keeps us from having even more danger and hurt and harm into our life. So it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? What's fascinating, though, is we want to make sure we eliminate danger in every possible way in our lives we possibly can. We have so many different things we think of our safety and how we avoid this risk in every possible way. In fact, what's fascinating to me is Brian Redmond, who uh, is connected with our church and serves at St. Petersburg, Russia, and is a teacher of English there and, and sharing the gospel in the midst of that, is that he says when he comes back to America, he sees how much America is just totally connected into how do we eliminate all danger and risk whatsoever. We are so into safety here, and we're trying to eliminate every single element that could possibly be risky. And it's fascinating to me that you get someone who lives in another cultural context who comes in and takes a look at that. And when he says that, it makes me go, huh, I need to try to understand that. I live in the midst of this culture. I understand we talk about how we eliminate risk and what we do, how we do for safety. In fact, we take that seriously here at this church as well. You've already heard us talk about safe training that we do for kids. That's an important thing. I'm glad that we have that value as well. But the reality is we cannot eliminate all risk. Risk is inherent in the world. There are things that no matter what, ha what we do, we cannot eliminate all that risk. 
We can try to be as safe as we possibly can, but the reality is if someone wants to do harm, they will do harm. And so oftentimes I think what happens for us is we come to the point of saying we lost control. We lose control, it becomes much more difficult and hard for us. And when we look at Jesus as the good shepherd, we have to realize that we put our lives into the hands of the good shepherd. And sometimes it's difficult because we take away control at that point in time. But I'm going to urge and say this, that even though you try to have control, you cannot have control. Because the ultimate one who has control is God and Jesus Christ. And so it's even safer to put your hands into that one than it is in anything else. Does this mean that we aren't going to do things to keep us safe? No, that doesn't mean that. But it just means that sometimes we get this image that we have this idea of control where we keep everything safe. And really, really, ultimately, we can't. So in that case, let's look at some of these scripture verses to understand what it means of following the Good Shepherd. If we live in a world that has risk, how do we live in this world? And how do we follow Jesus on a spiritual truth and plane? Of what's going on. So let's start out by looking at John chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at actually uh, verse 1 right now. Later on, we're going to look at several verses within John 10, some Old Testament verses as well. But if you want to have some homework for today, your homework is to go home and read John chapter 10, verses 1 to 22. And if you're really one of those ones who's the gold star student, read all of chapter 10, okay? So 10, 1 to 22, and then all of chapter 10, and you can really go further and deeper and realize that when Jesus says he is these things and he is the Messiah, there's a consequence that happens as well with Jesus when he does that. So that's your homework for the day. So let's look at John chapter 10, verse 1. And he says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. So here's Jesus in this context in which he's in this Middle Eastern context, and people are listening to him, and he begins to talk about the sheepfold. A sheepfold was a place where oftentimes they would gather the sheep. Now, it could have been a lot of different things. It could be a sheepfold more out in the countryside somewhere, and they bring the sheep in closer, and they put them all in the sheepfold, or a pen, that sort of thing, for the evening, for them to be safe and take care of them. Or it could have been a sheepfold in a village. In a village, maybe uh, you would have four or five sheep, and you might have six sheep, and you might have seven sheep, you might have two sheep, who knows what it was. But as they would take those sheep out to the grazing areas for the day, they bring all the sheep back in, and as they brought the sheep back in, they put them into a common sheepfold. And what was interesting was the shepherd, as they called the name of the sheep, would know exactly which ones they would go to. And so they might have this common pen that all these different ones they go to. We don't know exactly which one that he was using in his mind here, but regardless, each of those were the case. So here it is. He says, here's this sheepfold or this pen, and there is one who says, who sneaks over the wall instead of going through the gate, and that one must surely be a thief and a robber. So here's what I want to say to you today. Spiritually, when Jesus is talking about this, he's saying there is risk in this world. There is pain in this world, there's divide in this world, because there's a thief and a robber who comes in and wants to sneak over what is the area for protection for the sheep and wants to bring harm to them, wants to steal, wants to kill, wants to destroy, wants to divide families, wants to cause difficulties, wants to cause struggles. He is real and he's active in this world, however he has no real power in this world. He's coming to hurt families, to disrupt marriages, and to cause people to make bad decisions. And this is one that we call Satan, one that we call the, de the devil. And he, this is his purpose, is to cause destruction and difficulties. So as you look at ta chapter 10, we start out with this very element that says, there is one who is the bad shepherd, or, or the anti-shepherd, or the one who is not like Jesus. And he comes in to steal and kill and destroy. In fact, if you go to John chapter 10, verse 10, he goes on and says this, the thief's purpose is to steal and and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them what a rich and satisfying life. Notice that. What God's purpose is, what the purpose of Jesus is, what the good shepherd's purpose is, is to give a rich and a satisfying life. And, and so he has a lot of ways that he does this. He does this where he comes and brings to us the purpose for our life, a direction for our life, and how we're supposed to go. 
And so we have this at the very start of chapter 10, this idea that we have a shepherd who puts the sheep in the sheepfold, but there's a thief who comes in and tries to steal and kill and destroy, and the good shepherd is one who will protect the sheep from that, and also the good shepherd's purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And so that's who he is and what he's about. Now, if he's a good shepherd, and if there's a bad shepherd, but the question is, who are the sheep? Well, here's what I would say is, I would say, we're the sheep. And it helps us to understand this in the context of some important Old Testament references that further define Jesus as not only the shepherd, but also divine as the Messiah, and also to who the sheep are and how they're taken care of. So two verses that you can look at later on today are Ezekiel 34, 5, and 6, and also Ezekiel 34, 11, and 16. Now, Ezekiel 34 essentially reminds us and tells us what he is. So when Jesus talks about these things in John, he's going back to these images that are in the book of Ezekiel. And when he has these images in the book of Ezekiel, the people who are listening to him going, oh, that's what you're talking about. So the passage in Ezekiel is talking about a time in the nation of Israel when the nation was not taken care of, the nation had been hurt, the nation was at risk, the nation was going to be destroyed, and basically the leaders of the spiritual world of the nation had left them abandoned. And this is what 34, 5, and 6 says. Is, so my sheep have been scattered without a shepherd. Notice that imagery. And they're easy prey for any wild animal. They wandered through all the mountains and all the hills across the face of the earth, yet no one has gone to search for them. So here's this imagery of Jesus who says that he's a good shepherd. It's harking back to these days that the people understand from Ezekiel. So they're going, oh yeah, yeah, that, that was the time when they weren't taken care of. The sheep weren't taken and we're the sheep, and he's a good shepherd. He's coming to search for us. And then later on in chapter 34, verses 11 to 16, it says this, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I'll be like a shepherd looking for a scattered flock. I'll find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered under that dark and cloudy day. And I'll bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the people and the nations. In this context, he was talking about the nation that had been scattered and was in exile in different places from where they were supposed to be in the promised land. He says, I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the rivers, and all the places where the people live. Yes, I will give them good pasture land on the high hills of Israel. There they'll lie down in pleasant places and feed in the lush pastures of the hills. I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace, says the sovereign Lord. I'll search for my lost ones and who strayed away, and I'll bring them safely home again. I'll bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. I love that injury. Bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. But I'll destroy those who are fat and powerful and I'll feed them. Yes, I'll feed them justice. So the Lord says, I will also be watching out for those who are preying on those who are weak and I'll feed them justice. So we can see that that's an important thing for God in this midst. So Jesus comes to his role as a good shepherd and as a Messiah. And he helps to reconnect the sheep. Now here's what the question I want to ask is this. How many here are people who have a great internal sense of direction and know where you're going when you travel anywhere? Anyone like that? A few of you. Okay, great. Anybody here have a really bad sense of direction and get lost all the time? Good, good. Thank you so much for your honesty. And what's fascinating, too, is this happened in first service as well. There's about four or five folks whose spouse is pointing to them <laughs> behind their head so they don't know, okay? Marriage counseling is available after the service. So, uh, my, my point is this, is oftentimes we understand that. There are some folks who just know where they're going. And there are some folks who don't have any clue where they're going. And, you know, without GPS or without ways, it's like they'd be toast without it, okay? That's just the way that it is. But here's the thing about us. As sheep, they get lost rather easily. Sheep just wander off. Why? Because sheep have their head down, and they're grazing, and they're eating, and all the other sheep can be over here. And this sheep's just having a good time, and eat, and eat, and eat, and eat, and eat, and no. And next thing they know, all the sheep are over here, or they wander down a path this way, or they wander over here. Sheep get lost so easily. In fact, check out this verse, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. 
So here are sheep who also get strayed away so easily and so readily and they don't see what's happening. Sheep without a shepherd get lost. That's the principle we want to understand. And, and also, too, sheep without a shepherd not only get lost, but they can wander over a cliff. As I was doing my research for this sermon today, uh, I was doing some research and kind of found this article that talked about in Turkey, modern day Turkey, they still have sheep that are out in pasture land. There's still shepherds that watch over them. I imagine they have some sort of technology or whatever, but some shepherd had not done his job. And so 1,500 sheep went over a cliff. Okay? 1,500 sheep. Now, here's what's interesting is. And if you're an animal rights activist, I apologize, this might sound a little bit cruel. However, the reality is 400 of those sheep died, okay? But 1,100 lived. Why? Because 1,100 landed on 400 that fell first. <laughs> and they created a soft landing for them, okay? My point is not so much that. I mean, again, it sounds pretty sick and rude, and I'm sure I shouldn't have used that illustration. But <laughs> the point is this, okay? Sheep are stupid, okay? And what did I say? We are sheep, so therefore we are what? Stupid. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, pastors always want to call us for stupid. Way it. So, you know, it's just one of those things. No, I'm kidding. I'm one of the sheep too. So they just tend to be stupid. They get lost. They wander over a cliff. And, and it makes it a very, very hard time. And think about it. Stop. We wander around. Think of a hard decision you have to make. Think of something that you're not aware of. You know, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I should do. Well, I'm around. I don't think about it. I don't know. I'm praying about it. Just, we're, we're the same way. We wander around. We don't know what to do. And we find a cliff. And what do we do? We keep going. And we step over the cliff. And we fall. And get hurt. Hopefully there's not 1,100 more of us coming after us. You know? <laughs> At that point in time. But the reality is we get lost. We tend to wander, and sometimes when we wander, we can fall over a cliff that brings harm and difficulties and destruction. Now, let me also find out this. How strong and defensive do you think sheep are? Okay? Not very. What do we normally think of when we think of sheep? Ah, oh, soft, cuddly, warm, aren't they nice? What do we think of when we think of uh, wolves and critters? They have fangs, they have claws, and they run fast, and they catch up to sheep. And sheep are all of a sudden in trouble, right? Okay, now by the way, I'm not trying to make wolves negative there, but my point is this. Here's the deal. Sheep are defenseless. Sheep can't protect themselves. If anything, they'll come together as a, as a, as a body, that sort of thing. But unless the shepherd's there, they're in trouble. And without the body of Christ, we're defenseless. Without the armor of God, we don't have any defenses ourselves. If we as sheep are not careful without the good shepherd, we'll be devoured. And how oftentimes do we feel that way? When we ourselves are overwhelmed, when we ourselves are not sure of what's happening, let's face it, many times we feel like we're going to be devoured. And many times we feel like we are devoured. And you ever feel that way when you just feel consumed and overwhelmed, you're alone, you're scared, and you have no defenses? We need the good shepherd who is the best defense for us of all. And see, here's another thing about sheep. They are very stubborn as well. Okay? Now, look at the person next to you and say, I think he's talking about you. Go ahead. <laughs> good. Marriage counseling is available after the service. So, at any rate, here's the deal. Yeah, some people are still arguing. No, it's you. No, it's you. No, it's you. No, it's you. Okay. You're stubborn. Okay. Both of you. So the point is this. Uh, one pastor shared this story about sheep who are walking in those hills and those cliffs and that sort of stuff like that. And they walk through an area where there's two rocks that are together. Okay. Now, if you've ever been through an area, like maybe you've gone to a cave or maybe you've gone to a hiking place and you try to walk through and you kind of get through and you have to suck in your stomach if you're like me or something like that and you barely get through. But if you get through and you can't go through, what are you going to do? You don't back up, aren't you? Well, here's what they said. Sheep will walk through, and they're so stubborn, they'll just keep going. And they'll get stuck. They're so stubborn, they'll do that. And they'll actually not back up. Is that stubborn? They'll just try to make their way through there. But a good shepherd is the one who will come in, pull them back, and pull them away, and set them on another path. That's a different section for us. And so... Sheep can be stubborn. Now, how many people here have ever raised sheep or had sheep in their, in their, 
Anybody here? A few of us? Okay, yeah. Do sheep smell nice when they're wet? Okay. Sheep stink to high heaven, okay? People think pigs stink. Sheep stink way more than pigs, especially when they're wet and that sort of stuff like that. They're ones who just have to be taken care of. And when you stop and think about it, the bottom line is sheep are dirty, and the only way that we get this nice, white, warm, cuddly, nice sort of sheep is if they're clean. And here's the bottom line. We're dirty as well, and we need to be clean. Amen? We're filthy, and we need a Savior. So sheep will run away. Sheep are vulnerable. Sheep need community. Sheep need protection. Sheep need cleansing. Sheep by themselves are incredibly vulnerable, and they need a good shepherd. So what does a good shepherd do? Well, one of the passages that talks about a good shepherd is Psalm 23. Now, Psalm 23 is one of those verses that a lot of us know. We usually hear it in the context of the funeral. But here the very first verses of Psalm 23 says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. So what's this tell us? It tells us that the good shepherd guides the sheep. He tells them where they go. Listen, it says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He lead, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He provides for me as well. Those things are important. He takes them to where they need to be. He leads them beside the still waters. If you've ever been to a river that is fast moving, stop and think what it's like when even you step into it, you could be afraid that you could be swept away. How much more, for, more so for a sheep to step into the water to get a drink and then go in too far and all of a sudden this, this land gets pulled away down the water. Sheep drown in these instances. So the good shepherd leads them beside the still waters. The good shepherd takes them to the green pastures. And the good shepherd is the one who puts them in the paths of righteousness. The good shepherd is the one who takes care of them and all those things. He protects and he provides. And think of it that a shepherd oftentimes carries a rod and a staff. And that rod helps to pull the sheep back when it's needed to. It might guide the sheep in a different direction. It might divide them if they need to be divided. It's the one that also protects them if a wolf comes, protects them in different ways. The good shepherd uses his rod and his staff to be able to take care of them in the way that happens there. There's also correction that can also occur for them to know what's going on. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 to 13 says this. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. Now, don't we love discipline? No, we don't like that, do we? But yet, look at what it says. God's discipline is always good for us. Why? So that we might share in his holiness, his righteousness, that guiding, that protecting, that providing, all those things there. It says, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So the good shepherd trains us in the ways of righteousness so you're able to go and have a straight path. In fact, the verse goes on to say, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. So we can see that this all helps us in a good way. That's why we have the good shepherd. But the good shepherd also does some other things. I think this is the essential center part of all this. The good shepherd says in John chapter 10, verses 11 and 15, says this. I am the good shepherd. There it is. There's the I am saying. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. His hired hand says, here comes the wolf. Hey, I'm just hired. I'm not going to take care of the sheep. I'm going to run out and get out of here. He'll abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks him and scatters the flock. And the hired hand runs away because he's looking only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. And then he says again, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. And just as my father knows me, and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. Here's the key element. Jesus is the one who is the good shepherd. Not only does he know his sheep, but he also 
knows the sheep know Jesus. <clears throat> Just as my Father, God knows me, and I know the Father, so I sacrifice. So in other words, the way that Jesus knows God the Father, the way that Jesus is connected to God the Father, because of that connection, therefore, Jesus, then he sacrifices his life for the sheep. And then therefore, we know Jesus, and we can know the Father as well. That's the beauty of that imagery. He lays down his life. And interestingly enough, he's in a place where the attack will occur. He's not just, uh, in general, he's in a place where the attack is going to occur. He's in a place where the bad shepherd, the Satan, will come and try to steal. He's in a place to make sure that doesn't happen. He's in a place to stand there and to be able to provide and be the one who lays down his life and give us salvation. So he provides, he guides, he protects, he corrects, and he provides for salvation. These are all things the good shepherd does for us. Uh, I'm going to share just a little bit about, uh, in my preparation for this sermon this week, uh, I was working at a coffee shop in, in, in Lafayette. Sometimes I just concentrate better there. Just, I don't know, it just helps me to think better. I don't know if it's coffee or if it's the location or what it is. So I was doing some, some work on this, uh, reading the commentary from uh, uh, the book of John, looking up some different things online, trying to find that little sick story about the turkey sheep, you know, sort of thing that fell down the cliff. So I'm doing that sort of stuff. But at the same time, I also had the, the, the news, the internet on, you know, and I saw some news feeds that come across. And I saw a news feed come across that nearly made me fall to my knees. I felt my legs get weak. And actually what I did was this. Yes! Like this. And everyone in the coffee shop is thinking, what's wrong with the weird dude over there? <laughs> okay. And the news feed was this, and I used this yesterday at the Abby and Libby uh, celebration of life. Uh, one of my prayers has been, during this whole thing with Abby and Libby, is that God would move in the heart of the person that did this so much, that the person would just confess. Would either go to the church and confess, or would go to a police department and say, uh, I did this, or in some way move them in such a way that they're scared out of their wits and don't know what to do and have to go confess. I would actually kind of prefer that from a sick way. Uh, or they would just go and say, i got to get this off my chest. Here's what I did. And I'll be honest with you, as I share that privately with folks, <coughs> most folks laugh at me. Most folks say there's no way that will ever happen. Last week in Connecticut, a woman that was killed in 2014 while jogging, her killer went to the pastor and confessed what he'd done four years ago. When I read that, like I said, I just had to throw my arms up in, in delight and joy. And, and, I, and really, my legs, I felt them grow weak. I really thought I was going to fall down in the puddle on the floor, and I didn't want them to call the cops. So, you know, what happened to you? I read the internet. Okay. Uh, but for me, it was a moment of, of hope that was needed, and I shared that with the folks yesterday at the Abbey and Olivia Memorial. Like I said, normally I've done that privately, but I just decided that now was the time to be more public about that. That God would move in a way that would make no earthly sense. Yeah. See, it makes no earthly sense for someone to confess to something like this. But it makes every bit of heavenly sense. And I believe this, that the good shepherd is the one who moves in things and makes things right that cannot be made right on this earth. And so whether justice comes on this side of the grave or the other side of the grave, the reality is it happens. And the interesting thing about this article, in fact, the one I turned off happened to be from the New York Times. They're out there all over it. But... Uh, that article also said that as the police talked with this person, it corroborated every bit of evidence that they had that they had not released to the public yet. Sound familiar? I don't know what it means for us here today. All I know is what it meant for me when I was working on my sermon. And what I know is this. The good shepherd is the one who provides the good shepherd is the one who brings salvation. And the good shepherd is the one who will make all things right in the end. Amen. And we can believe in him.
And so, I want you to hear this last verse in conclusion from John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18. It says this, The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. So when Jesus goes and Jesus stands at the cross, people aren't taking his life. No, he sacrificed it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want and to also take it again, up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. Jesus was obedient to his Father. And because he was obedient to his father, he laid down his life. He represents the father's love for us. That's why the father loves him. And the love is overwhelming. And the love is for all people. And the love is for the father of the shepherd who protects and saves the sheep. And so we as sheep want to run away. We as sheep are vulnerable. And we as sheep need community more than ever. And the shepherd lays down his life to honor God who gave him what he was supposed to be and his task. And so, I just want to ask you this question. Is the good shepherd your shepherd? Have you ever confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you asked him to be your protector? Have you asked him to be the one who loves you? Have you asked him to be the one who redeems your sins? Again, I said it last week, but I'm going to mention it again. If you think that coming to church is just about checking off boxes to say that you're good enough, you are wrong and you will be bound for hell. That's all there is to it. Okay? Amen. And I'm just letting you know that. It's not for me to say, hey, that's not going to work. The thing is, when you submit to the one who is the good shepherd and say, take away my sins and forgive me, he'll give that to you. And then out of response, you'll be obedient like the good shepherd is. Did you notice that? The good shepherd says, I'm obedient to my father. Because I and the Father are one. And so then when we have the good shepherd in our lives, we become one with the Father. And guess what? We can be, then be obedient in the paths of righteousness and holiness. And he makes us complete. So I'd like for you to pray this prayer if you've never confessed the shepherd as your shepherd. And I'd also like for you who need to be able to say, you know what, Jesus, I need you to correct me and make me right where I'm wrong, to pray this as well. And he will do that. So if you would, join me in prayer. Holy God, I need you in my life. Forgive me of my sins and be my good shepherd. Thank you for providing a way to the Father. Thank you for forgiving my sins. I trust you as my Savior and will live with you forever. Thank you for loving me, God. And let me be whole and complete with you. Lord, when I have strayed off the path, bring me back to your path. When I need a new direction, point me in the right, right way. When I need protection, let me put on your armor. When I need a new way of thought, let me use your word. Forgive me, Lord, and let me follow you. Amen. That's where we stand today. And next week we'll talk about Jesus as the bread of life. And we'll celebrate Holy Communion. And it's World Communion Sunday. And it'll be a great time we look at how Jesus truly is that place for us where we find every forgiveness that we need. I'd invite the praise.